probably the most common impression people have of the Apostle Paul is that he was a man of action. You know, he was full of boundless energy, he had strong opinions, he, he produced copious writings, he was always on the go, he was very, very passionate about things. As we'll see today, he was also a man of prayer. One of my favourite books about Paul is, and I've mentioned this before, <laughs> One of my favourite books is by um, a minister called James Stewart. And he wrote a book called A Man in Christ. And I learned three really important lessons from that book about Paul. Firstly, that there's a big difference between Paul and what he calls Paulisms. Okay? Paul, that's our knowledge of Paul. That's what Paul said and did and wrote. Okay? Paulisms are all the ideas and theologies and traditions that, that have been generated by that, have been generated by Paul. Not by Paul himself, but by other people. So that's the first thing. The second thing, Paul himself is not a systematic theologian, where everything he did and said was well thought out and consistent and clear. Rather, he was a man of passion. He loved God, and he loved the gospel of Jesus Christ, that gospel we were talking about a few minutes ago. He loved it. And then the third thing, and probably this is the most important thing if you want to understand Paul. Everything Paul did and said and wrote only makes complete sense when it is considered in the light of what happened to him on the road to Damascus. Everything stems from that day. Although personally, I don't think that what happened to him, the change that took place on the road to Damascus was just a one-off, was just something that happened out of the blue. We know that Paul had a great start to life. He was very devout, godly. He was a promising student under a famous Jewish teacher. He loved the God of Israel. He quickly began to make a name for himself in religious circles. He was, he was the man to look out for. He was, he was ambitious. He was going places. We first meet him in Acts chapter 7. That's where he actually approves of someone's murder. He thought it was right. It was the murder of Stephen, the stoning of Stephen. He thought that was... That was a godly thing to happen because he thought Stephen had been blaspheming God. After that, he, we learn that he, he heads up the Jewish oppression of the early believers. He, he searches them out with a band of soldiers. He arrests them. He has them taken off to thrown into prison. He's determined to completely wipe out all the traces of this new heretical Christian movement which is a threat to the Judaism that he loves. But alongside his zeal, I tend to think he would have begun to experience a growing uneasiness. I think that the, the witness of the people he arrested, the faith of the people he arrested, the way they responded to the persecution, the, the hope that they all seemed to share, that would have rubbed off on him a bit. And, and, and this, this resolute faith they all had in this person called Jesus would have made him think, who is this Jesus? And I'm sure that when he was lying in his bed at night, his thoughts would have been more and more troubled about all of this. And then... On that momentous day, on the road to Damascus, he encounters Jesus in person. And Jesus says to him, Saul, Saul, why? Why are you persecuting me? Why are you doing this? And his experience of that day, and his subsequent experience, because he was struck blind, remember, his subsequent experience of being healed by one of the Christians he had been setting out to persecute, it just astonished him. It made the whole thing real. And it sort of blew him away. And the result was a, a total sea change 
in his understanding of who God is. He realized that the God made known through Jesus is, is the God of grace. He's the God who knows everything there is to know about us, but who loves us no less for it. Who is always ready to forgive and to set us free from any fear we might have to live a life of peace. The gospel of truth. And from that day on, Everything that Paul did and said and wrote is influenced by his desire that everyone should hear this, that no one should miss out. And it's a passion that's reflected clearly in all his journeys and in all his teachings, but even more clearly in his writings. Because he didn't just go around planting churches. He kept in touch with all those new believers and he did that through writing letters and with very few exception every letter he wrote begins with a prayer so we're going to listen to one of those prayers now it's from the book of Colossians and it's the first 14 verses and it's going to be read for us by Helen Shepherd. over to you Helen Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the holy and faithful brothers in Christ as Colossae, grace and peace to you from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all, all the saints, the faith and love that spring from the hope that is stored up for you in heaven and that you have already heard about in the word of truth the gospel that has come to you. All over the world, this gospel is bearing fruit and growing, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and understood God's grace in all its truth. You learned, you learned it from Ep Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is faithful minister of Christ on our behalf and who has also told us of your love in the spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And we pray this in order that you may live, in a, live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience and joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Thank you, Helen. I don't know if you noticed the number of times truth was mentioned in that prayer. Okay, so where's Colossae? Colossae is a, a, a market town that's on the road from Ephesus to the sort of eastern land. So it's on a busy trade route. So it's a busy place. But the interesting thing for me is that Paul himself has never actually been to Colossae. We saw there that his friend and disciple Epaphras, you did pretty well with that, sort of an ambush as you, Epaphras. Um, uh, he was the one who'd gone there. And he was the one who had preached the gospel there. And he was the one who had planted the church there. So Paul's never been to Colossae, but he's still writing a letter to the Colossians. And he's still praying for them. And there's something there for us all to learn, I think. And all this he's doing while we believe he is actually a prisoner in Rome. So there's the irony. Like those first Christians who he went around arresting and throwing into prison, Paul has now been arrested for his faith and is in prison awaiting trial. But he's still writing letters. In fact, an awful lot of those letters of Paul that you find in the New Testament were written while he was in prison. And what does Paul pray in the beginning of his letter? You know, 
Be before COVID, I would say, now, if you open your Bibles and have a look, I'm going to be working my way through this passage. But since COVID, we sort of got out of the habit of having Bibles handy because it all appears on the screen. Well, you'll just have to bear with me, folks. Um, we're, I'm going to be working my way through this prayer in the passage. It begins by Paul simply thanking God for the Colossian Christians. He, he says they are part of a worldwide movement of faith. It, it's this lovely image. You know, on the day of Pentecost, it, the, 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 the power and the presence of the gospel in the Holy Spirit sort of goes, great big splash, pouring out love and joy and power and truth and strength, and ripples spread out all over the world. And one of these ripples has reached Colossae. So Paul describes the church there as part of this worldwide ripple, this worldwide movement of faith. So he thanks God for that, but most of all, he thanks God for the way the Colossian Christians reflect their faith is reflected in their love. In other words, their faith wasn't just an intellectual thing. Their faith was having a big impact on their lives. And through them, it was having a big impact on the lives of others. And then from Thanksgiving, Paul goes on to what we would call intercession. He, he, he asking God on their behalf. He intercedes for them in his prayer. He asks that they be filled with wisdom and understanding. You see, becoming a Christian is not like passing your driving test. Hands up if you ever passed a driving test. Quite a few of you have. You know, you do the hard work, you pass your driving test, then you forget everything. <laughs> Within reason. <laughs> and you hope you don't have to sit another one again for a long, long time. <clears throat> well, becoming a Christian is not like passing your driving test. It's not a sort of one-off event. Tick. Okay, I'm a Christian now. You don't become a Christian and immediately know everything there is to know about your faith. It's more like you become a Christian and you start this journey learning more and more along the way and none of us, none of us have actually arrived yet. We're all learning along the way. And the way we learn is through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit teaches us as we go. So every time you read the Bible, every time you read a, a Christian book like A Man in Christ, for example, or every time you, you're, you take part in a discussion, or you go along to a link group, or you hear a sermon, every time you need to be saying, okay, God, what are you saying to me today? What are you saying through your Holy Spirit? What do you want me to learn about you and about your purpose for my life and about what you want me to do? It's a constant learning process. And Paul prays that the, the Christians and Colossians would constantly be open to learning, would be filled, filled with the knowledge and wisdom of God. Why is this wisdom and understanding so important? Well, Paul's prayer goes on to say, so that we can live lives that reflect God's glory. So that we can live lives, Jesus calls it life to the full. So we can live life to the full, bearing fruit in all that we do, having a good impact on the people round about us, growing in knowledge, and above all, growing in character. And he singles out endurance and patience. And it makes me think, maybe it was the endurance and patience of those first Christians that he had persecuted that really impressed him. And above all, their forgiveness and their love for him who was their persecutor. This is what made their testimony so powerful. This is what made their persecutors so uncomfortable. This is what challenged their persecutors' way of thinking. This is what challenged Paul's way of thinking. And so he prays for the Colossians' character, that they would display these characteristics. The early Christians, despite their persecution and suffering, were good people to be with. Even Paul, when he was a prisoner in Rome, was a good prisoner to be with. The guards loved it when it was their turn to guard Paul because he was a good person to be with. He was, he was kind and forgiving even of his jailers. He was trying to be Jesus, to live out 
live a life that was Christ-like. He was a good person to be with. And those early Christians, if you like, set a benchmark for all of us. Here at Liberton Kirk, whether here on a Sunday or during the week, whatever we do, we need to be good people to be with. And that's something we cannot manage on our own. But we can manage when we allow ourselves to be filled with the Holy Spirit. When we allow God's Spirit to work through us. So that's what Paul's praying for the Colossians. And I'm sure for us too. And then towards the end of his prayer, once again he gives thanks for all God has been doing in the life of the Colossian believers. And he finishes with powerful words, words which one, once again bring to mind his own experience on the road to Damascus. Could we just have the final slide from the reading up again? It's verses 13 and 14. He's talking about Jesus. And it's like, this is why, this is what it's all about. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. This is Paul, Paul speaking personally here. He has experienced this in person. He has been rescued from the dominion of darkness through the Son. And I'm reminded there, just keep it up. I'm reminded there of a phrase which I, I, I first heard used by Margaret Forrester, and I've used it before, but it's a lovely phrase used to describe the church. The church is just a community of forgiven sinners. We are people who have been rescued from the dominion of darkness into the kingdom of the Son, God loves, in whom we have redemption the forgiveness of sins. We are a community, like Paul, like the Colossians, we are part of a community of forgiven sinners. And this is really, 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 really important. Because if we think of ourselves as forgiven sinners, then we find that we will tend to be slow to judge and quick to forgive ourselves in our encounters with each other, in our encounters with the world, in our encounters with people who really irritate us, in our encounters with people who take a loan of us, and our encounters with people who persecute us, we will, as forgiven sinners, we will still be slow to judge, quick to forgive. And when we are slow to judge, and when we are quick to forgive, we become good people to be with. We become lights in the darkness. So, there we have Paul's prayer. What have we learned? Or, <laughs> what has God's Holy Spirit been talking to us about today? What, what, has he been, what does he want us to take away with us? I've come up with four questions. The first question, thinking of Paul and his experience that brought him to faith, what are the experiences that we base our faith on? What are the experiences that have brought us to faith? Personally, I find that a really good question to ask myself because when I think about that, I think back over my life, I think back over events and incidents, but I also think of people, people who have been slow to judge, quick to forgive, full of the grace of God, and they've all contributed to my journey of faith. What are the experiences that you have based your faith on? Good thing to think about. And that leads to the second question. How have these experiences impacted your understanding of who God is and what he wants for your life? And that leads to the third question. How much have we let that understanding of who God is and what he wants for our life actually have an impact on our lives? What difference has it made? Are we slow to judge? Are we quick to forgive? 
Are we good people to be with? Finally, how much of this is reflected in our prayers for ourselves, for others? Let's just take a few moments and in silence think about these things. Loving Father, we thank you for Paul. We thank you for his love of you and of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you for speaking into our hearts today. Come now and fill us again with your Holy Spirit. Make us the people you want us to be, that we might live out the truth of your gospel in everything we say and do. For Jesus' sake, amen.